Hello, Daily Riders, Zach here with RevZilla, and welcome to another episode where we learn about bikes as we ride. Our guest today is the Moto Guzzi V100 Mandelo. If you don't know about bikes, you'll be looking at that thinking that's a pretty cool looking white motorcycle. I don't know. If you do know about motorcycles, you will know, of course, that this is a comprehensively new and exciting machine as of a year or two ago anyway, from Moto Guzzi. It involves a quirky, interesting electronics package that is unique in the world of motorcycling. And then it's got this new engine that is cut from whole cloth, built from the ground up to try to capture some of the essence and character that Moto Guzzi has built over the past hundred years, but also take a step toward the future. The whole package will cost you about $15,000 and there's a pretty obvious question. Do you get all of that technology and all of that character that the brochure promises? Does it work as, say, I don't know, a daily rider? You're in luck. We're about to find out. <laughs> Alrighty, everybody. Before we get going here, quick reminder, this video is brought to you by RevZilla. RevZilla, in addition to being the YouTube channel that you are watching, is an e-commerce platform where you can get all things for you and your motorcycle, whether it's a helmet, jacket, boots for you, it's uh, saddlebags, tires or some sort of cleaner for your machine, it's all at RevZilla.com. Some of the money that RevZilla makes by selling parts and accessories for riders and machines goes into making content like this, Daily Rider or the Shop Manual with Ari Henning, the High Side Low Side Podcast or CTXP Adventures. So next time you do need something for you or your bike, we hope you'll keep that in mind. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Yogi Doki. The Moto Guzzi V100 Mandelo, where to start? <laughs> At the engine, where we always start, right? That is a 1042cc 90 degree V twin. So the same cylinder display as a Ducati, but it is transverse. So the cylinders are like this instead of like this. That comes along with its own challenges and quirks, but the most important thing to keep in mind with this 1042cc engine is that, like I said before, it's all new. It maintains the same shape as Moto Guzzi engines have historically been, but of course makes some pretty major changes. Chief among which, the cylinders have rotated. So instead of the intake being here and the exhaust being here, they've swept it so that the intake comes in from above, the exhaust comes out here, there's liquid cooling now, and that cylinder shift means a lot of other things have moved around and evolved as well. The alternator is tucked back up in here. Now, uh, of course, the, the intakes and airbox are up uh, sort of under here, which means the fuel tank runs back under the seat a little bit. And instead of being a big single plate dry clutch at the back of the engine, it is now a wet multi-plate unit that sits in a similar place, I think actually, back here somewhere maybe, or where is it? <laughs> anyway, the point is it is wholly new and modern and the benefit of that are a few things. One, the liquid cooling helps control the heat in the engine more accurately, which makes the engine more efficient. It's also, the new packaging has made the whole engine four inches shorter than the 853cc engine that's in the V85TT from Moto Guzzi, which is, I think is interesting that it's a you know, much bigger engine, much higher performance, and yet is actually more compact. So gives you an idea of how big a stride Moto Guzzi made with this engine, and I think it's pretty cool. Tip of the cap. It's very similar to the changes that BMW made to the flagship Boxer engine for the 2013 model year in the big R1200GS. The cylinders flipped, all new updates to the clutch and to the transmission and to the layout of the engine and to the whole dynamic of the, of the layout. From a chassis standpoint, the engine is a stressed member, kind of similar to what we talked about with the Harley-Davidson Nightster we covered recently on Daily Rider. So this steel tube trellis frame reaches down and grabs the engine and connects uh, the engine to the headstock. And then the swing arm connects to the back of the engine essentially. And the swing arm involves a bunch of uh, really nifty stuff that I'm not gonna get into right now, but um, you can learn all about it in the article that is linked in the description of this video if you like. The most pertinent information to keep in mind is that because the engine is shorter, the swing arm can become longer, which is better for handling and is widely agreed upon to be good in modern motorcycles. And of course, back here, you got a single-sided swing arm, which is really cool to look at and uh, sort of a, uh, not a wholly Italian thing, but a stereotypical Italian thing to do and uh, for good reason, because it looks pretty darn cool. As for the rest of the componentry, it is fairly basic suspension because this is the base model V100 Mandelo. The upspec S version comes with semi-active Olin's fork and shock, as well as tire pressure monitoring system, 
some other stuff in the dash like phone connectivity heated grips and uh probably one other thing that i'm forgetting maybe black wheels at the very least i believe so the point is the chassis in this bike is a little bit more basic than the upspec s model but of course you save a couple grand on the price as well just a couple other quick things to note before we take off here. One, the pretty heavy scoop in the saddle here, which we talked about on the Z900 that we covered a couple episodes ago, which is important to remember when we're talking about comfort. And also, uh, these guys here. This is the active aero panel that pops up at um, a predetermined speed. You can set it in the dash. We'll talk more about that later. When I'm looking down at my lap and trying to show you these things, uh, keep in mind this is what they look like when they are not deployed. This is the panel that moves. So you have another look at it. All right, gosh, well, if I forgot something, uh, I feel like I've talked long enough right now anyway. So um, we'll fire up this TFT dash and then we'll fire up this engine, which is um, really sort of crown jewel of this bike. Ooh. Yeah, it sounds burly, don't you think? <laughs> All right, what else we got? We got Brembo brakes. We got uh, these little pockets here, which is for the luggage that can fit on there. Stop talking, Zach, just ride to work. Rev this sucker up, do the thing. <laughs> All right, everybody. And I'm gonna go to work. Okie dokie. Now rolling, we can start talking about specs. Where to start? Price, I guess I said $15,000 is actually $15,490. So $15,500 for the base model Mandelo, and I believe it's $17,490 for the S model. So $2,000 extra dollars for all the extra kit that you get on that S model. While we're at this red light, we can talk. Okay, we're not at a red light anymore. Uh, we can still talk about the seat height, which I believe is 32.1 inches, which I think for a bike um, of this size, is uh, pretty approachable, a uh, fairly low seat, um, considering it's a uh, very much a full-size motorcycle from the price to the weight, which with a full 4.9 gallons of gas in the tank came in at 525 pounds. Other numbers, 115 claimed horsepower and I think 70 something foot-pounds of torque. I don't remember exactly. Specs are in the description of the video as always. Ultimately, the takeaways for the numbers on the V100 Mandelo is that it is a full-size serious motorcycle. Not hugely intimidating, I don't think, but not for the faint of heart. Especially, I think, the curb weight, which it weighed in at 525 pounds, but I might have even guessed it weighed more than that. I think it feels really heavy coming off the kickstand, and when you ride it down the road, it doesn't necessarily feel heavy like it's light enough to handle but it does not feel light it is a fully ripened piece of italian machinery it definitely has a weight to it both from the actual feel of it and the character of the engine which we'll talk about in a minute here from an ergonomic standpoint i think moto Guzzi absolutely nailed it it is an awesome riding position the handlebar is not too wide not too narrow feel sporty enough that when you cut through corners like this you sort of think yeah okay I'm kind of almost riding a sport bike but it's also just upright enough to feel really comfortable it is the nail hit squarely on the head as far as ergonomics goes it's comfortable sporty commanding but also relaxed out on the open road now we can do our typical merge test here 45 miles an hour and open the throttle in fifth gear and you can see that <laughs> the engine is very eager it has tremendous low-end grunt and the way that it delivers the power too is just like oh it's awesome and before we get going too fast here i'm going to jump over in the menus here to the windshield regulation <laughs> uh section and press up on this little toggle switch to my left and you'll see the windshield comes up the electronic adjustability i gotta say is very very nice you do have to do it under 70 miles an hour though as far as i can tell because now that i'm going 70 75 here i can't adjust the windshield but if i go down below 70 now i can move it around it's one of those things that i find very quirky about the bike like electronic windshield you want to adjust it at 72 miles an hour <laughs> no 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 as far as the wind protection that it provides for me it's darn near perfect and i don't mean perfect in the sense that it's comprehensive like it covers my whole body 
I just think what it does is it pulls all the wind away from my chest in the upper position. Basically, it leaves my helmet in fairly clean air. My shoulders get a little wind blast, as do my arms, but the main part of my body does not get any perceptible wind hit at basically any freeway speed. And that to me is what I'm always looking for. Being in a perfectly quiet pocket of air is very luxurious, it's nice. And big touring bikes sometimes achieve that. But I don't need it and I don't even know if I want it in most situations. What I want is to ride down the highway and not be tired from it clinging onto the handlebars. And that's exactly what this bike does, it offers that. And if you want the sort of feel of a naked bike, then you can just drop the windshield down provided you're going less than 70 miles an hour. And then you get some wind blast on your chest and it feels even more kind of uh, naked and raw. And all that talking about practical usability and stuff, I forgot about the active aero. So we're about to go 55 miles an hour in tour mode, just where I have it set for these to deploy. So as we get 55, you'll see them reach up, see that? And the reason I forgot to talk about them is that it does practically nothing for me sitting in the cockpit. I don't even notice when the little wings deploy and when they don't. And I feel like I've ridden in most conditions where I would notice that except for the rain. But right now, for example, is extremely blustery and gusty and windy. So the aerodynamics of the bike are getting kind of played with constantly. I didn't notice when these suckers came up and even on a calm, quiet day, I don't really notice it. So that's the quick review of the Active Aero. I think it's really neat, but I don't think it does anything really perceptible. I also want to talk about gearing on the highway. You daily rider fans will know I always have something to say when it comes to final drive gearing and the spacing of the gears feels too modern. Fourth, fifth, and sixth gear are all really close to each other. And I think that's a miss because the engine is just so strong and dynamic and has such a huge wide rev band. We're cruising along at 3,500 RPM right now, something like that, maybe a little bit over that. If I go down to second gear, okay, it's a little fuzzy in second gear, but third gear, 6,000 RPM, it's like a little bit of buzz in the handlebar and the foot pegs, but it's not that bad. And the fact that the engine has all this range and the fact that it has so much torque and grunt down low, I just wish fifth and sixth gear were more widely spaced. Like give me a true overdrive so I can let this tractor of an engine just lug along the highway. We should also talk about fuel mileage and range. Moto Guzzi very proudly claims about 50 miles per gallon, I think, or 55, something like that. Some of it starts with a five, I'm pretty sure. And I never saw mileage quite that high. I did see mid 40s pretty regularly. One tank was 37, which I think might be down to some of my friends and colleagues at Revzilla West being pretty excitable when it comes to twisting the grip. And so that tank in particular was pretty bad. And you will be tempted to twist the grip on this bike. The engine is super fun as we'll experiment more with in other sections of the ride. But the point is, as usual, your fuel mileage will vary. The thing I did want to point out about fuel range is that with the better part of five gallons on board, you can get pretty good range. You should be able to get a couple hundred miles if you're getting good mileage. What I don't like is that this range meter up here, you can see it here, it says 134 miles right now. That little range meter disappears when the bike goes on reserve, which is I think at nine tenths of a gallon of fuel left in the tank. And that means that the range is showing 40 or 50 miles and then the range estimator goes away which I understand that the bike doesn't want to promise that you can get somewhere, but that feels a little aggressive. Like right when I need the range estimator the most, <laughs> the bike's like, I don't know, good luck. And I end up filling up at 140, 150 miles pretty often just because I got a little spooked. But uh, you know, as usual, you need to learn your machine as you ride it. Boy, oh boy, have I been doing a lot of talking. And, and just like that, we're into the stop sign challenge in the neighborhood section here. And I haven't even talked about the mirrors, which are pretty good. Uh, same mirrors you get on Aprilia Tuono, I think. Uh, sort of part spin Piaggio Moto Guzzi Aprilia mirrors. And um, I don't really have any complaints. As for the V100 Mandelo's manners around town like this, uh, pretty darn good, I think. Um, pretty stable. I think the clutch feel is a little, it took took me some getting used to. It's just a touch grabby and a little bit numb in my opinion. And the ride by wire throttle is pretty smooth once you get used to it. It doesn't have that horrendous on off throttle and like huge driveline lash that a lot of bikes have, though it is perceptible. Um, that stuff I got used to pretty fast. Um, the thing that you can't really ever avoid is the weight of the bike, which is significant and fairly high up, I think. So despite the seat height being a pretty reasonable 32 inches, 
I think you're gonna find the bike does feel heavy around town, especially if it, you know, starts leaning at a stop sign a little bit more than you're ready for. In general though, the manners are quite good. And of course this engine doesn't really have an RPM that it doesn't work at. So you're probably gonna be pretty satisfied with that if I had to guess. Ooh. Pretty good foot the stop, I think. For the stops are a little tricky with a longitudinal crankshaft because the crank goes this way and the engine and spinning this way or that way, whichever. And um, that means that when you twist the throttle, the bike kind of twists a little bit. BMW owners will know what I'm talking about. This is a classic thing with longitudinal crankshafts like in a Moto Guzzi or a BMW. And um, stand one up. Moto Guzzi did take some steps to try to mitigate that by making the shaft that turns the alternator turn uh, counter to the crankshaft. So they spin in opposite directions, they counteract some of uh, each other's inertia and that supposedly makes the um, torque reaction from the engine a little bit less noticeable. I am not sure that any of that really matters. I just think it's interesting technology and um, Guzzi deserves some credit for addressing something that's uh, sometimes has been called quirky to a fault about their machines. All right, time to go. See what this engine can do here. <laughs> Delightful. Okie doke, headed for Lover's Lane here. We can mess with the cruise control that we did not do on the highway. Uh, if you hold this switch over here to the left, you'll see that this green light starts blinking and shouting at you about how cruise control is ready, which I think is kind of annoying, but never mind that. We can set it and we can hop back onto the passenger seat and talk about passenger accommodations, which I think are pretty good probably a little sportier than some people are going to want. I did see plenty of complaints on uh, the internet about how the passenger seat is just too narrow and it's too thin and there isn't enough leg room. And I think that that could be true, but I also think that the expectation for the V100 might be slightly different than what the bike actually delivers. I think it might be sportier and a little bit less comfortable than people are expecting. For the rider, as well as the passenger. Right into the twisty road section here. And the Mandelo is gonna deliver right here, I think. I think if you wanna ride smooth, twisty tarmac all day long, you're gonna be so comfortable and so happy and so engaged and so enthralled with the noises that the bike makes. <laughs> it's uh, quite good at this kind of thing. And uh, I think you should hold that expectation if that's what you had before. If I were to level a criticism at the Mandelo in situations like this, it's the suspension is not as, hey now, RAV4. The suspension is not as good as I want it to be. It feels kind of harsh and a little bit unrefined on this base model anyway. And I was a little surprised by that. I played with the clickers, the preload, and some of the damping settings a little bit. And I never really found anything that I was thrilled by it has five inches of suspension travel front and rear basically i believe and sometimes it feels like it's got half that especially in the back sharp potholes and sharp bumps sometimes just kind of like kick the chassis a little harder than i feel like is appropriate for a bike of this kind of stature i'm sad that i didn't get a chance to try the upspec s model and if that's what you're thinking i do apologize i would have liked to try the quick shifter i would have liked to try the upgraded olin's suspension and I would have liked the heated grips too, uh, since it's been a little chilly around here lately. My suspicion is that the S model suspension is better in a way that will be noticeable. And I'm not going to say worth it, but worth considering. <laughs> Friendly reminder that is a suspicion and not an actual review. I just think that um, based on the base models, slight lack of refinement in my opinion that the upspec bike is probably a bit better all right on to surface streets and we can rev up this engine again <laughs> boy oh boy all right red light so we almost always catch here and we can talk about brakes 50 miles an hour we'll stab these big brembos <laughs> You see the four ways come on. That is a more and more common safety feature on motorcycles that when you panic brake like that, the four way signals come on to notify drivers behind you that you're braking hard. Uh, the brakes in general are excellent and they're exactly what I wish 
I got from the seat and the suspension and a couple other things on this bike that I have leveled critiques at. They're just always there. They feel progressive. There's never any question, no matter where you are in the lever pull, that you're going to get the braking performance that you want. It suits the stately nature of this bike. Right, stuck at the back of the line here of this traffic light and we can talk about some of the dash features here. Uh, you can see I'm in tour mode. If I hit this button down here on the right with my right thumb, I will go to rain mode, sport mode, and road mode. Those are your options. It's a green light already. Obviously, we're gonna have to come back to the dash. I do have a couple of things that I would like to see different about the dash. But in general, it, uh, it works well. And um, it's got a bit of an Aprilia feel to it, which is, uh, of course, sister company to Moto Guzzi. Um, but uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. The, the font's clean and it's not too busy, though it is a little more crowded than I think I'd like to see. This is a section where we talk about how much I love the engine and if it wasn't clear, the engine is a reason to get this bike. It is unique and very holy Moto Guzzi and yet much more dynamic and ferocious and um, modern feeling than Moto Guzzi engines typically are. I wish I tried the S model, like I said, because I'd like to try the quick shifter. But one thing I like about this powertrain in general is I like shift. I like pulling in the clutch and trying for the perfect shift because it is quirky and characterful enough that it doesn't always work the way you want it to. And I say that as sort of a, a compliment, really. I think that it makes for a more engaging experience. And I appreciate that. All right, let's talk about this dash one more time, shall we? Where was I? I was talking about the font and that kind of thing. I think that if this, this dash could use a really, truly stately, clean tachometer, because this, this sound in this engine is what you want to be listening to and paying attention to. And I don't really care what the temperature gauge says, really. Like, just tell me if it's wrong, I guess. The bike doesn't need a dash that is more beautiful than this, but it does deserve a dash that's more beautiful than this, in my opinion. But anyway, on to the more practical matter of uh, how it works. If you hold down this right uh, button on this four button keypad over here, you will enter this menu where you can jump in and change these options like backlight and uh, the ride modes, which are all adjustable for um, the active arrow, the uh, trash control, and uh, the other thing but that means <laughs> I don't really remember uh, anyway is it a good dash yes is it a great dash not as great as the bike I don't think okie doke coming to the end of the ride here boy have I talked a lot about a lot of different things I feel like I've rushed through so many things I probably forgot to talk about some things and if that's the case I'm sorry but I would like to circle back to that um, original and obvious question that I asked right this uh, this bike promises new age technology and it promises uh the the sort of uh strength and character poise uh uh essence of of a moto Guzzi. and do you get all of those things the simple answer is yes you do and i i think do i think the bike's perfect no definitely not um i don't but I would challenge someone who doesn't like it to tell me what they think Moto Guzzi should have done within the confines of the company's pedigree and history and resources that is sort of like better than this. I think it's modern in the right ways. I think it feels cool to ride and it really captures a lot of what I've always enjoyed. And I think a lot of people have always enjoyed about Moto Guzzi. Overall, definitely a passing grade. Okay, time for the dirt road short cut. Uh, I would actually, I have not really done a lot of playing around with traction control. Oh man, there's still water here. Son of a gun. I haven't done a lot of playing around with TC modes. Um, so I'm going to try, actually, let's start in rain, which you can do the um, ride modes on the fly, which I really like for what it's worth. Um, and we'll try, ooh, <laughs> it's pretty frisky in rain mode. Uh, I didn't think it was going to, I guess it's like a little more conservative when you're in this sort of muddy slick stuff here Oop, do, 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 do. okay let's go to no no we're not ready for sport yet uh, let's go to road and we'll try <laughs> god the suspension feels harsh on this too oh yeah road mode definitely allows you to 
<laughs> like wants to jump forward even TC on. Okay, so just for the heck of it, we'll try a tour and see if this is different. Not really. That's one of my problems with the ride modes. Oh, is that uh, they don't feel different enough to me. Sport with TC off. <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> that is that is as burly as you can hope for a V-twin to feel. <laughs> Especially a 1000. I mean, if you told me this is a 1200, I probably would believe you. It really does feel strong and satisfying. It's great. <laughs> okay, back on to the yeah, 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 yeah. Back on to the safe stuff here. And we will find out if the Mandelo can wheelie. It's certainly got enough stomp. I haven't done a lot of wheelies because it doesn't really seem to like it, but let's try. Whoa. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is quite a bit rowdier than I've gotten up to this point. <laughs> it's not a great wheelie bike. It doesn't want to do wheelies. Uh, it's not really what it's for, but, uh, but it does, it does deliver. The thing the engine really likes doing is this. Second gear, third gear, open it up. <laughs> All right, last test here. Can you back it in? This, this is not really the type of thing I like doing with Moto Guzzi's. <laughs> There's a little back in there. Uh, it's hard to get the tail end light with the front brake, just because, not because the front brake's not good, but it's a, it's a lot of mass to sling around. <laughs> Uh, it's again, it's not made to be a hooligan bike. <laughs> you can sort of force it to do that kind of thing. Uh, it doesn't love it though. And that's fair, to be honest. I don't blame you. Um, you're good at plenty of stuff, Mandelo. You don't need to, you don't need to reach for any star that you haven't gotten to as far as I'm concerned. All right, fun bike. Uh, time for a U-turn test. We've only got two spaces to work with today. Is that going to be enough? The steering sweep's not great on this bike. Low speed manner is decent. Steering sweep is, um, yeah, less than ideal, I think. You know, full lock left. Uh, as far as we can go, ah, nope. <laughs> so that'd be, uh, you know, 2.2, 2.4 parking spaces, be my guess, which is okay. And, um, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty unapologetic freight train of a motorcycle. I don't think that you really expect a lot better than that from a U-turn on a V100 Mandela. All right, we've completed yet another daily ride. Uh, let's take a listen to this engine. Don't mind if I do. In fact, you don't even have to listen, but I'm going to. Feel how it's kind of like slow to rev up and slow to come back down. And it makes it feel a little bit old, but also a little bit stately is the word that keeps coming to mind for me. Whew, fun bike, fun bike. Alrighty, let's see what you, the Daily Rider audience, has to ask about the V100 Mandela. First question here is from Carlos the Spanish Armada, <laughs> who asks, in a world with more and more ADV bikes, is there still a place for this bike? I like this question. Smart question. And my answer is yes, especially in a world with more and more ADV bikes, is there room for this? Uh, what is it? Is it like, it's not a naked sport bike. It's not really a sport touring bike, but it kind of is, but it kind of isn't. It's one of my favorite things. It's sort of um, a bit of a category defying model. And I think it's fun. And I think the world of motorcycling could use more manufacturers thinking this way. What's the bike we want to build? What's the bike we want to ride? Instead of saying like, well, the naked category has this opening and we feel like we can fit into that market. That's probably a good way to run a business, but this feels true and pure in a way that I like, even if it's imperfect. Next up is a question from Cars, Cats, and Movies. An adjunct to some other touring question, how is the legroom? You're six foot two, close enough to me. Uh, you need a thicker seat. You don't need a thicker seat. I think you might want a thicker seat if you're six two or above especially. That's what I would recommend. Next up, a question from Blacktop Roaming, who says, does the active arrow work or is it a gimmick? If I had to rate it on a binary system, awesome or gimmick, I'm going 
gimmick. Does it do something? Yes. Does it do enough for me to be impressed by it? No, it doesn't. Next question is from Camilo Botarocarizosa. <laughs> uh, that's too many letters for me to say all at once. Camilo asks, how does this bike compare to a Tracer 9 GT and are they competitors? Yes, good question, good question, good question. I think they are competitors. Technology, similar, power, similar. Character, totally different. I know they're both factory available showroom motorcycles, but this is the bespoke sort of like, ah, uh, listen to the sound of the cylinders rumbling across the hills. It makes me remember the gritty red wine of my grandmother's estate. And the Tracer 9 GT is like, man, I want to get to work and I want to feel alive when I get there. I want to do wheelies. I want the quick shifter to be like making my synapses fire and this is going to be sick, dude. Cool. That's a Tracer 9 GT. So the character and feel is very different, but yeah, uh, similar. Which one's better? I don't know. Next question is from Whiskey Moto, who asks Multistrada V2, 950 Ducati Multistrada V2, versus this Moto Guzzi versus a BMW X1000 XR for touring, comfort, and spiciness. Interesting question. I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. On the spiciness front, none of these bikes, none, a Multistrada and this bike is not going to keep up with an S1000 XR. Not even close. An S1000 XR is a pure sport bike that has upright ergos and will absolutely tear your face off if you're not paying attention to it. It's not as comfortable as this bike or a multi, um, but it is vicious when it comes to sporting capability. For comfort, Multistrada V2 is gonna, gonna be the pick of the litter, in my opinion. That's the one, if you wanna ride across the country tomorrow, I'd take a Multi V2. So the same goes for touring, I guess, and comfort are kind of the same thing. <laughs> so I don't think that this bike matches up well for like long distance touring against a Multistrada or spiciness against an S1000XR, but it is more simple than a Multistrada V2, and I think that, does something for me. And the character is very unique. The nature of the bike feels wholly different than anything else. And that's worth something. Okie doke, last question is from Otto Gets Blotto, who asks, if this bike was a type of pizza, which one would it be? Very stereotypical sort of Italian question to ask, but a good one. Uh, would it be thin crust, Detroit style, Neapolitan, New York, Chicago, etc.? What kind of pizza would the V100 be? I'm going to go deep dish, Chicago deep dish. And here's why. Not because I think that the deep dish is the best kind of pizza. If you don't like deep dish, I'm not saying you're not going to like the V100. But the reason I think is you're sort of like, oh, I'm going to get a pizza. And in the case of the V100 Mandela, you're like, oh, I'm going to get a motorcycle. I'm going to get the things I think I'm going to get with a Moto Guzzi. I'm going to get the V-twin sound and feel. I'm going to get the shaft drive. I'm going to get the Brembo brakes. I'm going to get the this. I'm going to get the that. Just like if you get a Chicago style pizza, you're like, I'm getting a pizza. I know it comes in and on a pizza. And then you start eating it and you're like, whoa, this is a bigger meal than I was expecting. And I think that the V-100 feels that way to me. Whereas you might have three, four slices of pizza with a regular pie. With your deep dish, one is probably enough. Maybe you'll have some of a second one, depending on who you are. And I think that there's a lot of depth and flavor and a lot of calories <laughs> in the V100. It's a really, really annoying and stereotypical thing to ride an Italian motorcycle and say, oh, the passion, the character. But it does deliver that in spades while also feeling modern enough to be a realistic consideration in today's marketplace and having all of the sort of electronic features that you'd expect, especially the S model. Italians will be very offended by this, I'm sure, <laughs> by me associating this bike with a Chicago deep dish pie, but I just think it's meatier and more than you're expecting. And I mean that in a positive way. Okie doke, everybody. Thank you so much for your questions. As usual, thanks for riding along. Let's get this sucker on the Daily Rider leaderboard. Just give me a second. I'll be right back. Yoki dokie everybody, here we are inside Revzilla West and the Daily Rider leaderboard. We got the Moto Guzzi V100 Mandelo ready to go on the board with the Kawasaki Z900 SE and the Harley-Davidson Nightster, which are the only two bikes that have been covered in 2024. <laughs> um, it's maybe not as much a runaway as you think. Is it better than a Harley Nightster? Yeah, 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 it is. Though I would like to point out that the Harley Nightster engine is like more modern and refined even than that Guzzi engine. It's a huge stride forward for Moto Guzzi and it's a really cool engine that that V100 has. The Nightster engine, I'm not saying it's better per se, but 
If you told me that I'd be talking in 2024 about how refined, modern, characterful, interesting, dynamic, powerful, um, and good to use uh, engines from Harley Davidson and Moto Guzzi were, I might have asked you what you were drinking. Um, anywho, as a daily rider, the Moto Guzzi V100 Mandela is better than a Harley Nightster. That probably won't be a huge surprise to you. Is it better than a Kawasaki Z900 SE? The capability is similar. They're both pretty good. They're pretty fast. They've got good options. They're pretty comfortable. They're in general, pretty good. Um, the Kawasaki Z900, I think, suffers from just from just feeling like it doesn't do anything that another bike doesn't do, basically, while it's a very good motorcycle. The Moto Guzzi V100 Mandelo does not suffer from that. If anything, it is so unique and different and, and full of, of character that, that it might scare some people off, actually. <laughs> the reason I bring up all that is that the Moto Guzzi V100 Mandelo is going to go at the top of the Daily Rider leaderboard, um, but not because of all of the, all of the character and the passion and the, the things that, that they put in it in the Mandelo. It's just better. The bike's just better. It, the, the electronic windscreen, the wind protection, the riding position, that stuff's all just better. Cruise control, it's, be it's better. It should be better. It's quite a bit more expensive, let's keep in mind. A very interesting dynamic on the board right now. Um, anyway, great ride to work. Uh, I had a hoot. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I hope you had fun. And uh, what's coming next on Daily Rider? That's for me to know and for you to find out. Hope to see you next time. See you, everybody. Here's a good example of it here, like when I'm sitting here. So when I twist the throttle, watch the bike. <laughs> see how it pulls to the left like that? Uh, so that's the kind of thing that uh, the company is trying to mitigate. And um, maybe it did. <laughs> Either way, it works pretty well around town.